is textual data. And making, getting meaning out of textual data is still, remains hard problem, uh, and there is a lot of demand for solving that problem. Furthermore, even within the textual data, realm of textual data, um, when you de deal with data of a particular domain, there are unique problems. So uh, if you look at the data um, that is on social media, there are unique problems. You look at the data that is of clinical nature, less clinical data, there is a special problem. If you look at um, financial data, there is a special set of issues uh, to look at it, right? So um, suppose you take a course on information retrieval. You will generally learn basic techniques about um, uh, you know, text processing. The difference here is that um, we find that uh, those techniques are necessary but not sufficient. They are not, um, they don't give enough understanding about the data. They give superficial understanding of the data. And with the growth of the data, uh, that uh, superficial understanding leaves too much for humans to do when you get, let's say, such result, right? So, um, deeper understanding of textual data and or deeper understanding of data of different modality uh, in the social data uh, is very challenging. And what I requested uh, the Roy to do is to give, uh, while not in beyond just the broad picture, uh, go through some examples and give you more like um, <coughs> uh, things that look hand, hands on. I mean, you're not implementing here, but I will give you very uh, detailed insight on some of those techniques. And the um, there are different disciplines of computer science. So you people, information retrieval, um, uh, database processing, natural language processing, uh, machine learning, or, uh, and we increasingly find that none of the techniques um, uh, the techniques coming from one single domain uh, or sub area of computer science are often not sufficient um, to uh, uh, do that complex processing necessary to understand what the data is about. And so combining them is also very important. And uh, in the research that Delroy has done, he uh, has done very um, uh, you know, significant work in generally that area, borrowing upon uh, language, uh, text processing, uh, lexical analysis, natural language processing, uh, even statistics that he may not discuss today, and uh, use of knowledge base or semantic techniques, right? So that is what the law is going to try to do. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, get Make sure that you really understand <coughs> what he's talking about. Uh, understanding few things in depth is more important than just understanding all the stuff, okay? Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sheth. I think you put it uh, quite eloquently. When, uh, today I'll talk about knowledge aware research, and uh, essentially what I'll be discussing is some of the challenges that are involved with uh, doing text processing on domain-specific texts. Uh, but like Dr. had said, uh, there are a number of NLP uh, information retrieval techniques that work uh, up to a certain degree, but when one deals with domain-specific text, there are certain nuances of the text that one must take into account if you truly would like to be able to address the information needs of, uh, of someone who's working in the domain. So what we've done is, in this particular work that I'll discuss, we've actually created a system that uh, seemingly is aware of the interpretation of various elements that might be interesting for a domain scientist, so that when someone performs a search, the system seems to sort of know what's going on in the back, uh, which is much more effective than you know, like a classic keyword-based uh, search interface. So uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, some of this will be high level and some of it will be very detailed. If it's too detailed, then stop me and ask me to, uh, to explain, right? Right, so just to give uh, some introduction. Um, so the prescription drug abuse problem in the United States, it's now escalated to the level of an epidemic. This announcement came in May of 2011 by the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, uh, where the CDC reported that up to 40 people die every day from prescription drug overdoses. This number reached almost 15,000 in 2008. This is part of a general, a general trend in uh, increased death rates resulting from drug overdoses. This number has tripled since 1990. Uh, so 
Mortality is obviously a very serious issue. An even more critical issue, however, is the issue of cost. Uh, what the CDC reports is that for every <coughs> individual who dies from a drug overdose, there will be uh, 10 admitted to uh, an emergency department, rather 10 uh, admitted for treatment, 32 admitted to the ER, and up to 130 people who will continue to be dependent on these substances, possibly over a lifetime. I just want to make one uh, interesting comment. Most of the time, um, in your studies, let's say you're doing masters, right? You would be uh, placing a lot of importance to understanding a particular technique. And what um, the lawyer just say is something that most of you don't pay enough attention to. Even when I got some feedback uh, about uh, you know this course, and I uh, you know uh, uh, I saw that. Many of you were focused on the uh, programming things. How do I learn hands-on? How do I, uh, you know, get particular results? Uh, how do I learn a technique? I think you've done that, and you should have done that lot. In, done a lot of that in many courses. But what really misses out, you miss out, is the fact that if you, nobody cares about your techniques. People care about having a solution to their problems, and. Um, there is a significant jump from your knowledge of <coughs> techniques to determine which techniques are best to solve a problem. And there is no, um, uh, so uh, you know, if you are going to be a person sitting in the back room doing what somebody else will tell you to do, exactly how to do it for the rest of your life, then this is not important. But if you ever wanted to be seen as a person who solves a problem and move up in the career, then and this, you know, paying attention to what users need, what customers want, that is going to be of fundamental importance. Uh, <coughs> recently, um, uh, there was a, uh, there's a manager from Amazon who came and uh, I arranged a meeting um, uh, between him and uh, some of our master students. And uh, so, Shiva, what did he say? Uh, he was talking about uh what to focus on. Hmm. But uh, he said two things. The, the two parts of the interview. Like uh, the fundamentals. 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 Data structures. Okay. And uh, where, how does exactly a particular approach work? We should know everything about it. Like what are the boundary conditions that we have to see? Limitations. And limitations of uh, what we take, what we consider is the approach. If this is your answer, that means I will give you a failing marks to what you got from that interview. You really basically wasted the opportunity to listen. You didn't even listen to what that guy was saying. He clearly wanted this. Yes, but the, that was interview one. He talked about second interview. What, what do you... Five of you were there. He was explaining about the flow of business. No, he said something very clear. What's going to happen? What happens when if you pass this technical interview? He says something very. You know, what was what is there in the second interview? He asked you to Google something. Talking about Amazon principles, customer. Did he? What did he ask you to Google on? It's about you know customers. You know how do I solve customers' problem? And that you were basically going to be asked to say that. You know, they say everything in Amazon is driven by the customers. Everything. So they will not hire anybody who don't understand that viewpoint and do not connect the work. They they all you know, they hire a software engineer, but software engineers, you know, needs to have constantly that antenna understand what problem they are solving for the customer. What customer wants is the first thing. 
have. Without that, <coughs> I'm not going to hire anybody. Right? Why? This is so. First interview that you will take online is the technical interview. Performance, data structure selection, boundary conditions, things that you uh, 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 you know can prepare yourself for. The second question was you're supposed to develop uh, understanding of uh, how. Uh, you know, what, 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 what is your job for? Your job is to solve customer problems or be driven by customer needs or driven by market needs. Why? So, so again, I think this, this message should, you know, you should be prepared for this kind of thing. Who were there? You were there in that meeting with Amazon? I'm missing the first part. But the, the second part that I'm talking about, you were there, right? When you talked about customer focus? No, he Amazon? just discussed about the, actually he's uh, working on e-commerce. Mm. So he just, uh, just discussed with his work, mm. his flow, like uh, how he is building the, mm. uh, uh, like all. Mm. That's what he discussed with. Are there you? Uh, yeah. You're there? You're there? You're there? You remember? Yeah. Customer focus? Yeah. So anyway. The point here is that um, as a computer scientist or software engineer, you know all the bag of tricks. Uh, you know tricks. You should know a lot of bag of tricks, right? And um, some of you will be good at NLP. Some of you will be good at visualization. Some of you will be good at um, machine learning. Some of you will be, you know, so you can. So some of you can do something else. And in the end of the day, none of that matters. The, the, the more important thing that people look for is. Uh, can you solve the problem? Okay, so, uh, you know, and that is where your career can get very limited, right? And um, uh, because if you only can solve technical problem, uh, that is the level at which anybody from elsewhere in the world can compete with you. There's nothing in computer science um, uh, that, uh, you know, can't be taught in India and China and other things. If you are talking about teaching you how to program, if you are talking about teaching how to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, implement something. What is going to be different is, and why should you be paid six, 60, 70, 80, 90,000 dollars when you can hire somebody for 20,000 dollars in India? So the justification is, um, a, a manager from IBM uh, said at a technical conference about you know, the panel was on job. He said, we do global sourcing of technical talent. So if you parse it, what it means that if for a programmer, I don't care whether the program is in US or um, uh, India or Philippines or, 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 or uh, you know, wherever, uh, I'll buy, get the person who, you know, resource that is cheapest. But the difference is that the person sitting in China and India can't really understand the customer needs. And what some you know what you know solution would work, and the uh, you know the psyche uh, of the users. Take the example of uh, uh, Twitter's announcement yesterday that they are going to sig uh, work towards simplifying the use. Twitter, many of you should find it very easy to use, and yet they find that they they are not able to grow because people still find it harder to use. You don't get that problem with Google search. You understand? And I told some people who have, you know, talked about me, what are the reason my company possibly, one of the strategic mistake, mistake I did was to go after that complex facility interface for query. I thought it was very easy. Oh, you think about Moderna and you want Moderna and film, you just say movie Moderna. People uh, don't want to do that. They just want to type in Moderna and let the system figure out that you want Moderna as a movie. Now, what is technical about it? There's a lot technical about it after you understand what customer wants. Because now the techniques necessary for making the single box work very well are different than the techniques needed for the other thing, having the whole facets. Right? So this is really critical. So I hope that this is something very concrete you will take away from this course. Uh, yes, uh, aside, like I said, from this issue of mortality, it's the issue of cost, right? Um, the, like I was explaining, for every one person who dies, there will be several others who get admitted to the hospital 
And uh, the more striking number, I think, is this number, 825, of people who will continue to use these pres prescription drugs for non-medical purposes. What this means is that these folks uh, are at risk of lapsing into these other serious, more serious categories. This is of concern to the U.S. government uh, because they estimate that the cost to society of prescription drugs per year, it's upwards of $181 billion. Um, so there are funding agencies, uh, the government uh, typically would give funding for uh, folks to study prescription drug abuse so that they can begin to curb this problem uh, and if nothing else, uh, reduce costs, obviously save lives. So um, there are two problems when, when addressing this general problem. Uh, first, epidemiologists who are scientists or researchers that study populations to detect emerging patterns and trends, they will typically encounter uh, a drug user and they will come to understand what's happening in the community when someone comes in for, for interventions or for treatment. Obviously, only so many people uh, will make contact with epidemiologists over uh, some period of time, and so this is not scalable. A similar problem exists on the other side where clinicians and toxicologists will interact with folks when they come in for treatment or they have an overdose, and so when they're filling out the questionnaire, they finally confess and say, well, I've taken 140 milligrams of loperamide, when in fact uh, I should only be taking 16 milligrams. So both these approaches, they are not scalable, and they also lack coverage across the diversity of, of practices uh, that uh, occur in the drug abuse community. What happens is, ultimately, for policymakers, the, the government uh, at the highest level, they end up in this reactive state as opposed to, to being proactive, right? Uh, and this is obviously contributing to, to the rising cost. What we have observed is that on social media, web forum discussions, uh, tweets, drug users are actually freely sharing information about uh, their opinions, their experiences, um, uh, the new things that they've tried. And so these sources are in fact uh, quite rich uh, for information that might be able to assist uh, domain scientists in detecting emerging patterns and trends and then shift you from that reactive state into a proactive state. So Freelos is in fact, it's a social media analytics platform developed to detect emerging patterns and trends in prescription drug abuse through automatic information extraction from these uh, unstructured uh, sources. And so uh, that's what I'll talk about uh, in, in the next exercise. Just to give an idea of the overall workflow of what we do in Freedos or what has been done. Uh, we, we developed a suite of web crawlers that go out and crawl. Uh, we've identified three uh, different web forums uh, with the domain scientists, uh, et cetera. And we collect this data, we've serialized the data into a database, and then we've created this drug abuse ontology, which is a structured representation of the domain of prescription drug abuse, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a bit more. And then we use this ontology to facilitate a number of information extraction tasks. Uh, there, we do entity identification, relationship extraction, uh, we do, I'll talk, that's the core of the talk today, template pattern extraction, and then even some sentiment analysis on top of that. And we serialize uh, these annotations in the Lucine, Lucine Index and also in a database, and then use them subsequently to uh, facilitate search across the text, uh, and analytics essentially dynamically generating graphs that help to give insights into what's happening. Uh, the, on, the, I think the core of the system is this drug abuse ontology that we have created. Uh, it's called uh, the DAO. Uh, the, the ontology is significant because it models um, slang terms that refer to standard drugs. And this is actually a very, very important thing. Uh, here in my example, I'm showing that uh, the term Watson's is actually a reference for a hydrocodone. Uh, what I have found in my own experiences from looking at the text is that the, the use of slang, it's so pervasive that if one attempted to use one of the classical uh, term frequency uh, based techniques, uh, it might not work very well. Um, you know, people don't say in text, uh, yeah, last night I tried some dope, uh, you know, heroin, uh, and it made me feel great. No one says that. What we've seen instead is that in the gold standard data set that we created, for every one reference of the uh, semi-synthetic opioid buprenorphine, there were 33 references to slang. People rarely use the actual uh, names. We found the same thing for the paramedic. So 
having these mappings in the ontology is really a critical step in improving recall in the search system, right? Uh, my favorite is hillbilly heroin, which is a reference to OxyContin. Um, that sort of thing would be very difficult to capture from the text. So the ontology helps, up, helps us with, uh, with these mappings. Right, so now just to look at an example of, to give insights into the actual complexity of our task. Here is a, a web forum post, it's a snippet of a post that we got from one of, of the sites. Uh, this post was posted by someone who had just uh, been released from a rehab facility and they were given some drugs to help with their withdrawal over the next few <coughs> days. So the person's reporting here what they did immediately after they came out of rehab. This is the kind of thing that domain scientists would like to know. Right, so uh, the guy says that he was sent home with five, two milligram uh, of Suboxone. Uh, Suboxone is uh, it's a subclass of buprenorphine, which is a, an opioid used to treat withdrawal. So if you've, if you've gone into rehab because you've been using heroin or whatever else, uh, you can't use it when you're there, of course not, right? So you, you may vomit, you may have sweating, all that. So they give you buprenorphine to help. Once you get released for the next couple of days or weeks, uh, you still remain on that. So they gave this guy 10 milligrams, and then they also gave him another drug called phenobarbital. Phenobarbital, it's, uh, it actually, it's actually used to treat um, convulsions. It's an anti-convulsant. Uh, this is actually not good because it probably means that this guy <laughs> would have convulsions from time to time uh, as a result of his drug over the, or his drug use. He's probably on the brink of something really bad. In any event, they gave him you know, the phenobarbital as well. Then uh, the guy says that he took all 180 milligrams of the phenobarbital. I'm not entirely sure that's what they intended for him to do. Uh, then he says that, that didn't do anything. It made him a walking zombie. And then he waited 24 hours after his last two milligram dose of Suboxone. So now he's switched over. He's taken two milligrams of Suboxone. And then 24 hours after, he tried injecting four milligrams of boo. Okay, so he's taking small amounts. By the way, buprenorphine here is a reference to Suboxone. Suboxone is one of the brand names for buprenorphine, and we'll talk about how we identify things like that. Anyway, he says that this gave him a bad headache. It didn't work. And then uh, he tried to repeat the experiment, and he waited 44 hours after his last 4-MG injection, and then he injected 2 milligrams. So he said 2, 4, and 2. That's uh, 24, 78 hours, 72 hours. And then he said there wasn't anything to speak of. And so five minutes after, <laughs> it started to feel good. So he's using like really small amounts over a longer period of time. Here's the issue with this. Uh, if you're not careful, you can end up using small amounts, but after some time, you could have a lot of this stuff in your system, right? We have a, a paper that went out, I think it's called When Less Is More, where we observe this kind of thing from looking at, uh, at scores of, of web forum posts. The challenge here is how do we develop uh, an information processing system that detects this less is more uh, pattern or, or trend by looking at these kinds of things in a seamless way. Uh, and that's what the knowledge aware search is all about. Uh, like I said, we have these mappings. For, there are several things one needs to do. One, you will need to be able to identify these slang references to drugs as we have in the ontology. We know that boop uh, is a slang term for buprenorphine, and we know that suboxone is a subclass, and so we can reason on that effectively. But to, to really address the need of the domain scientists, which is, you know, what's going on? What are, the, what are the patterns? We take a closer look at the text. What we see is that the expression 48 hours after, uh, it's actually an interval. It's, it's a structured uh, form of data. Uh, my is a possessive pronoun. Um, two, four milligrams and two milligrams, these are dosages, right? And uh, injected or injected, it's a route of administration. And then there's a sentiment expression where the person says that there wasn't really any sort of rush to speak of. So what we realize is that by, first of all, identifying these primitive data types in the text, and then compiling or composing complex patterns or associations across these primitive types, then we might be able to start getting insights into uh, these emerging patterns and trends from the, from the text. So we gave the domain scientists, I think it was one thread with about seven or eight or so posts, and they identified the things that were interesting. 
And we came up with these 11 different uh, template classes, we call them, that seem to capture uh, in some detail uh, the kinds of things that the domain scientists would like to do. <coughs> and so we've essentially used them to provide uh, a way to search the text to get some information out. Uh, at a higher level, uh, we've realized from looking at some of these early posts that uh, the data actually belong to these four different categories. And this is something that's very important to point out because some of the existing search systems and hybrid information retrieval systems, they're simply not uh, going to this level of depth either. First, there are those things that can, can be obtained from the ontology, like subs and suboxes and so forth. Then there's a second class of primitive data types that are of interest that one can obtain from lexicons. These are things like sentiment expressions, uh, emotions. The guy said there was a, or wasn't any rush to speak of that phrase is something that is uh, of, of interest. Then there's this other class of things that have only partial representation in, in an ontology and also in a lexicon. Uh, a good example of this is a, a phrase, I think the phrase illy. Uh, someone says something like, yeah, you know, my dealer made me illy. Well, illy is a, it's an expression. Um, it, it may be in, in some kind of an ontology if it's modeled, uh, but it's more than likely in the urban dictionary. And there may be some time between getting that from the urban dictionary into a, a structured background knowledge base, but the main scientists would like to know that now when you, I mean, you know, describe what's happening right now. So we've also modeled that. And then, most importantly, I think, uh, or perhaps equally importantly, are the set of uh, primitive data types that we can obtain by using uh, rules. A dosage, for example, it, it can be uh, a numeric amount with a, a unit, that sort of thing, right? So we've created this hybrid approach to, to information retrieval or knowledge discovery that uses several different categories or, or classes, essentially broader classes of data, and then provided a search interface that can search for these kinds of things without uh, a domain scientist having to know necessarily uh, how these things are translated in the back end, right? This is obviously a step up from what Google and some others do, because they, they don't go into this level of depth. If you search for greater than four milligrams in Google, it's only going to give you text that have four milligrams mentioned in it, and perhaps the word greater than with uh, some stem. Right, so to do this concretely, we've used uh, uh, what's called the annotation query language to specify uh, a, a bunch of rules, essentially. We, the AQL, it has uh, as one of its primary constructs, a dictionary, where one can specify synonyms for, uh, for you know, anything that you would find. So here's a buprenorphine dictionary that says, well, you know, tech and strips and suboxone film, these are the kinds of things that uh, generally, or we know, refers to buprenorphine. Then one exports these dictionaries as views, and then you can create these more complex views by nesting already defined views, and so you can build up these very these very complex structures. Um, an example here is you can define what it means to have an entity uh, route of administration and dosage by simply saying that, well, any kind of entity mentioned within two tokens of a route of administration with uh, a dosage, you know, four tokens after, then that's uh, an entity route dosage pattern. Okay. Uh, AQL is good because it allows you to sort of specify the translation of these uh, these views that you define, but the, the it does not allow you to uh, specify, you know, how or what queries can be interpreted by the system. Um, once you have queries composed, uh, then it will take care of the underlying interpretation. But at the higher level, in terms of query specification, it doesn't do that. What we've done is we developed a context-free grammar to uh, very clearly define the entire language of strings that can be interpreted by the search system. Uh, and a grammar is a good thing to do because a grammar, uh, it's each uh, production in the grammar is very, very well defined and uh, uh, we can essentially build up very, very complex uh, structures from the grammar in a nice, neat and reusable way. So we defined, and let me know if this is too detailed, we defined the context-free grammar of our hybrid information retrieval system as a quadruple for those of you who've taken programming languages. Um, it's basically a set of non-terminals, uh, a set of terminals, and a set of productions or rules that specify how the non-terminals are interpreted. 
and then there's a start set. We decompose the set of non-terminals into two sets, the set NS and the set NP, where we are treating those non-terminals that are directly uh, on the right-hand side of productions with the start symbol a little bit uh, differently from others. And then I'll you know, give an example of this here. So this is an example of one of the top-level productions of the grammar. Essentially, we say that uh, the start symbol S on the left-hand side, uh, it can occur with uh, a sequence of an entity followed by a pronoun, followed by a dosage, followed by an interval. Uh, and we provide this to the main scientist. What it needs to happen next is that from these top level uh, template classes, the system needs to interpret them, of course, right? To be able to actually get the strings uh, that the user might be interested, interested in in the text. And so the interpretation of these, uh, of, in fact, the interpretation of the, rather the user query language of the entire hybrid information retrieval system it's basically the set of sentential forms over uh, reproductions that can be defined uh, with the start symbol. Again, I'll make that more, more clear. Uh, this is an example of a sentential form. All that it means is that, well, an entity at the top level uh, can consist of a specific entity, buprenorphine, right? And uh, a specific personal, a specific pronoun may be personal pronoun, a specific uh, dosage may be greater than four, and then a specific interval may be by day or by, by hour. So the user query language covers all of the possible interpretations uh, based on, again, our, our definition of, of the graph. Uh, one can imagine, of course, then, that there may be several of these sentential forms that can be formed from these top-level productions. Of course, what we're getting after here is the interpretation of, of these sentential forms, interpretation of the grammar in general, so that we can provide these very specific uh, strings that match the, essentially the, the documents or the text snippets within the forms. Here, here's what we don't want. What we don't want is for, for the main scientist who's trying to find web forms that talk about buprenorphine, then a personal reference, then greater than four milligrams uh, in some particular interval. We don't want them to compose all of the possible ways in which that can be specified at the interface. It's, it's impossible, I would go so far as to say, right? And Google is not doing it. So the grammar defines what each of these elements are and how they're interpreted by the search system. And that's essentially what we've done. It, it does this to cover four different uh, categories of data in this hybrid uh, information retrieval uh, system. To achieve this, we have several intermediate steps. Uh, in the first step, uh, we generate from the, uh, the user queries, the system query seeds, uh, which essentially allow us to specify a range uh, in between these specific uh, terminal expressions. So what we say is, well, since we know that buprenorphine uh, subs can be an instance of that, uh, we will accommodate and allow a range uh, of tokens in between these so that we can retrieve from the system many possible different matches. And so after we've specified the system query seeds, of course, there can be many of these. Then we translate these into the actual system queries when the range operator becomes instantiated. In this case, so we said here that any mention of, of a sub uh, with the personal pronoun with uh, something greater than four milligrams at a day uh, is valid. Here we're showing that the range in the first case is zero. Uh, the range here is two, so there's two tokens in between, and then the range here is zero. And so you can imagine that these ranges uh, can be uh, you know, anything in between. And so this really allows us to capture a variety of matches in the text, as opposed to, again, having the domain scientist try to, to deal with that. Okay, and as, of course, as you can imagine, then there could be many of these that match a top level query. And so that's what the grammar is essentially doing. A very important observation here is that uh, some of these seemingly uh, terminal expressions, uh, like greater than four milligrams, uh, they may have some specific interpretation as well. Uh, the greater than operator, for example, here, um, it will cover, or greater than four, it will cover uh, six uh, as, as a number or as a word, uh, 10, as I'm showing here. Uh, so we have this notion of what's called a contextual compilation that actually specifies the interpretation of terminal strings 
because terminal strings being themselves have some kind of special interpretation in, in the system. And so, in fact, both non-terminals and terminals can be interpreted, and we've specified all of this in, in the grammar. And so, what eventually ends up happening is that for a given top-level uh, query, a given top-level production, the interpretation is really the Cartesian product of all of the strings that can be derived uh, from that, again, based on how we've specified that in, in the graph. And so this is what we've done, and uh, we've provided a search interface that allows the domain scientists to actually search and retrieve, uh, retrieve information. This is uh, for the purpose of making this a bit clearer. This is an actual system that we've developed, and it's in use by folks at the School of Medicine, uh, at SIDAR. Right, so in the interface, no? Thanks. Oh, no, I can't see. Right, so the main scientist may say, I'd like to find uh, any mention of the drug buprenorphine, right? And then I would like uh, any kind of personal references of what personal possessive. And then I would like any kind of dosage, let's go with greater than eight milligrams. And then give me any kind of interval, I'll go with daily for now because that's consistent. And then essentially what is happening is that the search system is translating each of these uh, terminal and non-terminal expressions and it's matching them with the web forms that we've crawled and serialized into our MySQL database. And then based on those matches, it fetches the data and it, it delivers it to the user at the front end. What we're seeing here is of course that the system is very slow. And so in, in the few slides I'll talk about how to scale. Uh, I think uh, at, at Noesis in general, we're sort of at a point where we're really, really concerned with scaling our applications. But a few important points to observe here about the search results. One is that in fact, not, very few of these search results will actually have the label buprenorphine in it, as I pointed to before. What we're seeing here are things like sub, suboxone, uh, and that's because of, of the representation in the ontology. Another important point is that the amount 24 milligrams in this text, it's obviously greater than 8 milligrams. Like I said, if you go to Google and you did this, if you got something that was greater than 4 milligrams, it's probably more than likely serendipitous than uh, the system interpreting uh, the meaning of that expression. Um, so, you know, some of these posts can be quite interesting. In, for the main scientists, uh, typical amounts were, it actually varies depending on, on the individual. But for people who are using amounts of buprenorphine greater than 20, 24 milligrams or so, this is kind of interesting for them to know. Uh, it would be difficult otherwise to, you know, get this kind of information uh, using another system. Uh, this is a case where the user says that the guy we buy from, he recently got on subs himself. So this is interesting. Uh, their dealer <laughs> has just gotten on Suboxone, and they have given him, uh, him they meaning possibly the, the folks at the rehab facility, uh, 24 milligrams two days in a row. That's actually quite high. Yeah. I wonder if that means 12 and 12 or 24. And then it says to no effect. Right, so, and then, so, right, so, and by just looking at this one specific post, right, so this guy's been given 24 milligrams over two days, and it's done nothing, and so this guy is now taking methadone, because it said that subs just don't work. Right, I mean, this is the kind of stuff exactly that the main scientists want to know, right? Uh, how are people responding to, to various amounts of these drugs, and then what's going on? You can imagine that if there was a, and I don't think there is, but if there was a side effect uh, non-terminal specified here, then you could refine and go further down to find out well, what are the side effects uh, based on these different uh, practices. So we are currently, uh, in Predos, we are using uh, web forums uh, at this point, and we have made a discovery uh, by doing this. Right, so we are using just the web forums to do this in Predos, 
And we discovered very early on in the, in the project by just mapping the slang expressions to standard drugs. But people were abusing uh, loperamide, which is an anti-diarrhea medication. They were taking it instead of subs. Uh, in these large doses, I think there's this concept of mega dosing that people uh, are talking about. I mean, this guy is talking about using 200 milligrams of loperamide. You should really just be using about 60 uh, milligrams or so. Um, there's the word megadosing here somewhere. Megadose. Yeah, if I megadose, this guy says it'll keep me. It'll keep me fine. Uh, Obviously, megadosing is not good. We had someone who contacted us that said that they read our article where we published this, and they said that they had been taking 140 milligrams of loperamide, and they got admitted to the hospital for something called PMDT. It's a sustained irregular heartbeat of more than 100 beats per minute. Uh, you can die, you can have cardiac arrest as a, as a result of it. So we reported these findings in our paper, and uh, we saw on the Blue Light website, which is the, one of the sites that we crawled, that they've since issued a warning uh, to say that uh, using loperamide in these excessive amounts can in fact have uh, clinical consequences. So this research, I think Dr. Shedden was just pointing this out, uh, there's been a team of uh, programmers, uh, postdocs, there's faculty, a number of folks, um, and there's a lot of technical work that go into this, uh, AQL and all these things, I, I learned that when I was an intern at IBM. But, uh, Concretely, what we've done is we're trying to meet a specific need, right? There's an information need where the U.S. government would like to know what's happening in terms of prescription drug abuse. And we've made some progress with this, and we're obviously extending this research to include uh, not just buprenorphine that we focused on here, but also uh, synthetic cannabis and cannabinoids, and also other forms of, of data, uh, tweets in particular, which uh, many of you may or may not be familiar with. Right, so I'm gonna skip forward here a bit and focus on uh, s some other aspects of the project. I mentioned that... Uh, Could you go to one two specific techniques? Yes, yes, in fact, that's exactly. Right, so I mentioned that uh, we are able to identify uh, these slang references to drugs in the text, and so this is the obvious question, well, how do we do this? We've uh, implemented and this is the work of Paul Fultz, who was a master's student that worked on this project. Uh, we've implemented a prefix try spotter that essentially the spotter starts by parsing the text. So it will look at the first token, uh, my, and it looks up in the, the list of labels in the ontology to see if there's a match. It doesn't find anything, and so it goes to the next token, and it continues to do this until it finds a candidate match. In this particular case, uh, black will match with black tar, uh, as one of the slang terms for heroin. Again, if you don't know this, then um, uh, this will really be uh, not good for recall. And then it finds the longest uh, subsequence match, uh, and that way we have a <coughs> syntactic match to uh, something in the ontology. It continues to scan the text, and we get down to hillbilly, and it matches again with uh, heroin, uh, excuse me, with Oxycontin. And so this is how this spotter actually works. <coughs> this spotter, of course, it's syntactic, and so there are issues with, uh, with this ambiguation that we'll, we'll address in just a bit, right? Uh, but at least from this particular snippet, the spotter would have matched with black tar with heroin and hillbilly heroin with oxycontin. We evaluated uh, just the use of the spotter and the ontology for NP identification, and uh, it actually performs pretty well. This is because, again, these mappings are really, really critical um, about 85% or so of the time the spotter was, uh, was actually correct, and we were retrieving about 75% or so of the entities that needed to be retrieved. Of course, the critical issue here is the issue of disambiguation. Uh, the word, uh, the slang term boy is a reference to heroin. Girl, I think, is cocaine. And uh, oxy can mean many different things. It can mean oxycontin. Oxycontin OP, Oxycontin OC, Oxycontin ER, Oxycodone. Uh, and so the next challenge in the project was this challenge of dealing with disambiguation. Okay? Uh, here are some of the scenarios that we found that were particularly challenging for us. Uh, homonyms, uh, the word boy, it has the same sound, uh, but it means very different things depending on context. Uh, there are hypernyms and, and hyponyms, these are a subclass and uh, the generalization and specification kinds of relationships. 
where, like I said, oxy can mean several different things. Um, and then there's poly polysemi or word sense. Uh, the classic case that we saw is the, a sentence in which someone says, I am done with doing. They're actually referring here to methadone as the second done. Uh, these things are, <laughs> are not so easy to, to deal with, right? So the question is, how did we, and, and this is not a problem that we've solved. We've uh, applied some techniques. Uh, this work is actually still outstanding. So for those who would like to get uh, deep involved in this, there's, there's stuff here. Uh, one of the things that I tried was a, a technique from uh, NLP. It's called deleted interpolation. It's based on a Markov model. Uh, essentially what the approach does is it tries to predict a word based on the previous N words. In this specific case, if I was trying to predict uh, what uh, concept book should map to, what I do is I actually implement an N window model where I take into account the previous four tokens. And so using the probabilities of these tokens in the corpus, I actually do this for the previous two windows, then I try to build up this language model uh, to predict uh, which particular uh, drug or which particular entity this reference of poop should be based on the things that have been mentioned before. Um, and again, just to introduce some notation, this is very standard in, in NLP. Uh, the language model essentially, uh, we're trying to predict the probability uh, that this word poop is some particular uh, drug, and we'll take into account the previous uh, two windows. Um, the actual computation computes, it takes the probability of boop itself in the corpus, uh, then the probability of boop given uh, the text in the first window, and then the probability of boop given the text in the first two windows. And these lambda values, uh, uh, they eventually actually add up to one. They're just used to smooth the distribution, essentially to weight uh, the n-gram or, or bigram or trigram uh, depending on the corpus itself. Now, I tried this, and this didn't work very well. Not surprisingly, uh, because of data sparsity and because of cascading ambiguity itself. Um, <laughs> although this case doesn't capture it. I mean, uh, suboxone that's here uh, could have easily been subs instead. Um, not uh, such a nice, rosy kind of uh, <laughs> mention of an entity. Um, also, once you filter out the... Um, once you filter out stop words in the previous windows, and then you remove, uh, you do some cleanup of the text, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to actually do the prediction. Just because of the way the language is, it's very, very important. So there are other techniques that can be used to do this. Uh, the one that I can think of uh, at the top of my head would be using singular value decomposition, which many of you may or may not be aware of. It's uh, a technique from information retrieval uh, essentially for search and grouping documents together. Uh, it tries to predict, or in fact, it tries to uh, find documents um, for a query based on terms that co-occur with the terms in your query. So it uses this underlying uh, co-occurrence uh, uh, model that uh, possibly might be able to help in capturing things that are, are related or similar. But again, there's a lot of technical work to be done here in this space. And for those who are interested, uh, you're certainly welcome to look at that. Another thing that we, that we looked at was identifying not just mentions of boop uh, as uh, references to specific drugs, but there are these things called modified entities, things like boop therapy or morphine recovery. Again, uh, as Dr. Shedd mentioned, you, you would like to always uh, tie whatever is being done at the technical level with your customer or your client, right? And so the domain scientists would like to know not just mentions of drugs and text, but they'd like to know in what context. Buprenorphine therapy is actually a very important thing because then you can start, you can start to gain insights into uh, are, are, is uh, my particular method of, of therapy, uh, is it working? Like what's, what's happening with that, right? So to identify um, these modified entities, this is the work of another master's student, uh, Garish, who recently has graduated. We use the linguistics-based approach that uses the Xerox parser. It's one of the tools at uh, NIH. Essentially what this parser does, let's take a look at the specific example here. In this specific text, uh, the user says that after that, uh, the normal WD 
And so what we did is we spotted this text and we replaced WB with withdrawal because we know that from the structural background knowledge. But the person saying after that, the normal withdrawal actually felt like sweet relief, whatever he's talking about. What we would like to know from this is that the person here is talking about normal withdrawal as opposed to abnormal withdrawal, right? And so the question is how do you capture uh, normal withdrawal within this text uh, without, uh, you know, in sort of a structured and principled way? Well, the underspecified parser essentially it would chunk this text. It chunks it into uh, chunks that, uh, that these are assigned based on the underlying specification of the Xerox parser. There are things like modals, auxiliary, uh, and several others we'll see. Uh, conjunctions. Some of these actually match the standard part of these tags from things like the Stanford Parson and OpenMLP and so forth, but some of them are obviously different. So the parser would start off by parsing the chunks after uh, into its, its separate chunk, and it tells me that uh, after is a conjunction, <coughs> there's a lexical match, or there's an input match here with after, and a lexical match to, to after. Then it moves on to the next chunk, and it, chunk, it chunks that with the punctuation, P and C, that uh, uh, indicates punctuation. And then it chunks, interestingly enough, that entire phrase uh, as one chunk. And what we're seeing from this is that normal withdrawal appears within this chunk as a sequence with a modal followed by a head word, right? So uh, this is interesting to see because if one were to use the actual part of speech tags uh, to get this, you'd be looking at uh, normal as an adjective and withdrawal as a noun. What we saw, and I'll sort of skip forward to the other cases, what we saw for several others that we parsed, where we were trying to identify these, uh, these modified entities, um, normal withdrawal, uh, WB, uh, is an adjective, JJ, followed by a noun. Uh, buprenorphine therapy, this is a sequence of two nouns. Uh, potent fentanyl analogs, this is an adjective followed by a noun, followed by NNS. I think that's, I don't remember what that is. But on the other side, the Xerox parser consistently actually uh, parses these to any kind of modal followed by a headword. What's happening is that by using rules on the linguistic parse, right, we actually realize that well, there's only one rule that needed to be specified here to capture uh, this set of, of <coughs> modified entities. If you use the part of speech tags using the Stanford parser, there's at least three things that you'd have to specify. I think over the full scope of things that we wanted to find, it was something like five rules using the Xerox parser compared with about 23 or 25 uh, using the standard uh, Stanford parser. Right? So the uh, I discussed using the uh, prefix try spotter, uh, which works at the strict uh, syntactic level. But here now we have moved from the syntactic level down to the linguistic level that looks at the, the part of speech tag. And so uh, in, in your training, I suppose, as masters and PhD students, it's important to be able to appreciate these kinds of, uh, of distinctions. Uh, obviously, uh, using the NLP parser uh, is not without its, its issues. Uh, we ended up with several false positives, and I leave it to you to suggest how some of these things can be dealt with. Uh, getting open as getting is, uh, <laughs> it's actually not really all that informative, right? But it's probably a model for open as. Um, there are several others. Uh, I think can uh, can aren't probably because uh, that word is missing the uh, the apostrophe. The apostrophe right? Okay, but on the other side, it really worked well for some of the things that we wanted. And again, this work is is still open. It's actually gone pretty far away. If someone wanted to push this uh, to the next level, it wouldn't take too much. Things like drug testing, uh, morphine recovery, drug problem, heroin users. These are the kinds of things that the main scientists would like to see uh, from the text and be able to study the data uh, on these different uh, dimensions, as opposed to just you know, identifying that there was morphine here in the text. There's much more going on than just that. OK, uh, this is the last bit of technical stuff, I think, that I'll try to wrap up. Uh, we also identified relationships from the text. A good example of this is 
here's a text snippet where someone says that uh, these findings suggest a possible role for buprenorphine in treating refract this is interesting refractory depression. So buprenorphine is an anti it's a semi synthetic op opioid used to treat uh, pain and uh, withdrawal. <laughs> interesting depression. In any case, what we are after is trying to capture uh, this relationship. Essentially, what, what this is trying to convey is that buprenorphine treats refractory depression. The first issue I'm, I'm pointing out here is that I think when we did this work, we hadn't applied the modified NPH factor. And so we only could recognize depression in buprenorphine. And so our challenge is how do we map in, refract or in treating refractory to some kind of a relationship? Uh, to do this, we First, we created a matrix. Uh, it's a concept theory to pattern matrix. So for all mentions of drugs within the text, we took the, the pattern in between, and we built up uh, these vectors. So if this first pattern is buprenorphine and depression, every instance where some specific text in between occurs, we put that into, into a vector, right? And we do that for all of the concept theory, so we end up with this huge uh, concept here to pattern matrix. Then we have in the the pattern in the columns in the matrix essentially a set of all uh, possible uh, relationship phrases or relationship containing phrases, and so we express those uh, as a separate matrix uh, called a pattern toward matrix, where we simply you know break it up into into unit graphs, right? So. Given this pattern toward matrix, uh, the, the challenge, of course, is to take these uh, terms in, in between, in treating refractory and all that, and somehow map that to a relationship. And so we did that by using WordNet. So from WordNet, we took all of the head words, or all of the synsets of WordNet. WordNet has uh, these head words that map to uh, synonyms, essentially, uh, semantic synonyms, some would say. Things like give uh, would map to um, to give, gave, uh, and a number of others, right? And so using WordNet, we actually did the same thing where we took the WordNet head words and we expressed it as, uh, as this uh, term, so it's really just a head word to synset uh, vector. And then we computed the maximum similarity for a given, pat a given pattern, let's say P1, Excuse me. Um, we computed the maximum similarity between this vector for P1 and all of the other uh, vectors for the synsets in WordNet. Uh, and we essentially assigned uh, the, the pattern to that maximum uh, head word as the relationship. And this worked OK uh, for simple things like in treating refractory, it maps the treats. Um, obviously, like I mentioned before, um, uh, we need to be able to identify modified entity. Uh, the, this doesn't work all that great, though, as you can well imagine, because it doesn't take care of things like negation, right? If the text had said that uh, buprenorphine does not treat a refractory depression, then that negation not uh, is not adequately captured in the WordNet synset. And so there are things like uh, CTAGs and NEGEX and so forth one might need to use to, to make this a little bit robust. But we have, again, in this text, uh, we had just about the 33% or so accuracy for relationship extraction, which is, is, is encouraging to start with. Um, once we extracted the relationships, we simply put them back into the, uh, the triples like I'm showing here. And then we had the domain scientists also evaluate that. And we are about 33% or so accurate which is it's a good start, again, given the complexity of the text. So the last aspect here of what we've done uh, is we've provided these analytics. It's very important to uh, also frame um, the work that you've done in terms of this kind of language. Uh, text analytics, it's actually, in fact, analytics in general, big data analytics, text analytics, it's a very uh, you know, sort of like buzzword in, in, in industry, in business, definitely. Uh, what people want is, to process text very, very quickly in a cloud or uh, some kind of distributed environment, and then provide these uh, services on top of that that allow you to gain insights. Um, IBM has a big project called Big Insights, using big data and getting insights from that data. So 
Uh, here, you know, is a case where we're dynamically generating a trend graph based on mentions of drugs uh, from different sites with negative or positive or whatever is selected. And we're, we're showing this information uh, to the user dynamically, right? Uh, what, what can happen from this is that spikes in the graph may or may not indicate uh, at least increased chatter on some particular drug. And then it may prompt the domain scientists to go take a look at the actual posts where those were extracted from and study those a bit more. If we do something very similar for peers of drugs, this is the emerging pattern analytic, and this is work by Alan Smith. Uh, and so I'm pointing out here that a number of master students have worked on, a number of people in general, on this project, uh, developing technical aspects, core technical aspects, but also with the focus on the needs of of the client or the customer really is a very important thing. Okay, so um, do I have a few more minutes or I can wrap up? Just uh, in three minutes or so, I'll try to make a very, very important point here. The uh, template pattern explorer that we developed, uh, there's a front end, of course, uh, that's running on the Noesis HPCO server. There is a query processor that takes in the user queries uh, at the front end, people select buprenorphine and all these other things. And then we have some query expansion going on, query matching, and documents are retrieved from the database and then delivered back to, to the domain scientists, right? And this is all running, uh, the, the annotations are extracted using a number of IBM uh, technologies, uh, big insights inside of Eclipse. I won't go into the details on this. But uh, in the app that I just showed a short while ago, it, it takes a little while to run. And this is actually not all of that, um, not appealing if you will try to scale this. One of the things that we're doing now, we have this project eDrug Trends and Prelos obviously is going, going on. Uh, we'd like to accommodate more data at a broader scale uh, more quickly. And so for you, I think going forward, getting into the job market, uh, being able to, uh, being, being nifty with uh, distributed and cloud computing, uh, these things will, will pay dividends, I think, uh, going forward. So one of the things that we discussed is how to move from this solution space where we develop, you know, put things together in our architecture just to come up with a solution uh, to the platform space where we're now talking and thinking very seriously about scale. Right? And there's some general things I want to point out. First, um, if we assume that we will have many users using the system, then we will need to deal with request scaling. And let's assume that Predos makes it big, and, uh, and eDrug Trends, of course. And we have a tool that's being used by many government organizations, many universities, then you'll have a high workload of requests, right? <coughs> so there are things that you can do, and uh, Jeremy and uh, Matthew, Matthew um, are, are you know, working on these kinds of things. But in OpenStack, you can probably have a, a proxy server to deal with these requests, and you can fire up several of these Nginx load balancing servers to essentially route the requests. Facebook uh, and Twitter and so on, they're obviously doing this. And then you will need to deal with the distributing the query processing. We no longer can have a web app sitting on Noesis HPCO. We probably would like to replicate, replicate the application on many different machines. So you may fire up several virtual machines where each one of them has the... What is the size of the data? The size of... It's actually not a lot right now. We have three million web forum posts, but uh, we're collecting tweets from Twitter. And I think we're... Six, seven tweets, mm. seven million. Yeah. That, that's, that's not that, that much, but again, if you're, if you're moving forward with the mindset that you will be able to scale, um, then you need to take this thing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it would be appropriate then if you have multiple of these application servers to then scale your, your data itself. The database storage, you probably might want to have uh, sharded and replicated MongoDB store uh, so that the queries uh, can be processed very quickly. And so that's, again, from the front end side. On the back end, what we're doing, again, is using this context-free grammar to extract all these annotations, right? And I think that took... For the one million posts uh, in this paper, it took like four hours or something to extract them all. Uh, that's if you have tweets coming in, right? So if you have tweets or you have web crawlers that are crawling, you know, the entire web, you, not all of the web documents will have annotations anyway that are of, of interest and relevance to 
to the project. So what we probably want is for those documents that have annotations that are relevant, we probably want to get the annotations, get the documents for us, and then put the documents into some kind of a queue, right? And then if you read the documents from this queue, there's ActiveMQ and RabbitMQ and all kinds of things that can do this, then you want to distribute the actual annotation extraction itself from these multiple documents. So uh, I think we did uh, Lima in Eclipse. It's obviously not going to work for this. The speed with which you crawl the data uh, will definitely exceed the speed with which you can e extract the annotations. So you might want to move to a distributed annotation extraction kind of environment. Um, IBM's Lima Duck is actually appropriate for this sort of thing. There are several issues to consider. I don't know that Kafka and Lima Duck, they are interoperable. Uh, IBM, I think, have uh, an IBM MQ, uh, which we probably don't have access to. And so you need to be able to, to bridge these things together. In any event, I'm pointing this out uh, just to make the point that uh, there are several things as you move forward. One is, like Dakshet said, you need to obviously learn technical skills, fundamentals, that's, that's a given. But then you have to develop a sense of what it is that the customer wants, what the client wants, if you would like to have, if you'd like to, I guess, set yourself apart in your, in your career, right? And I think in doing that, in really thinking about what the client wants, what the customer wants, you will make more informed decisions about how to do your development, how to design your architecture, how to do your system. One of the things Dr. Sheff has been discussing with me is, trying to now specify an architecture that integrates eDrug trends and credos because we've now reached that point where that's appropriate. Um, uh, if you're in a business setting, uh, if you, you could foresee th these things uh, and, and do that in the beginning, that would be really, really, really important. Okay. So I am going to stop here and make just one last point. Uh, from the the paper that we, we just put out, um, and again, from all the things I've talked about, one of the things I hope that came through is that we have, we're using structured background knowledge for uh, a number of core tasks. I, I showed that the, the prefix try spotter, again, this is standard stuff. It does entity spotting on a syntactic level, but it uses the ontology to, to map the text to some structured knowledge, right? Uh, for modified entity extraction, we had the uh, Xerox parser at the linguistic level, but that also uses the ontology. Uh, the template pattern explorer for knowledge of research with the search system that uses the grammar, it also relies heavily on the ontology. What we're seeing is this general trend going forward where <coughs> future information processing systems uh, will benefit from, from rich representations of textual content to harness the knowledge that is expressed in text. We've seen this, IBM has a, a project called System U where they're modeling users, it's for using, user modeling, and they're using structured background knowledge to actually model users. Uh, Google announced their knowledge graph a couple of years ago. Uh, Apple, Siri, and Microsoft Cortana, they're obviously using these things uh, for various tasks. Facebook's uh, knowledge search is also uh, taking advantage of that. Pohan has a paper in ESWC that uses hierarchical interest graphs. Uh, to filter tweets. Uh, so based on entities that people have mentioned in text, then he goes to Wikipedia and he traverses that hierarchy to get uh, richer information. Uh, in Fritos, of course, uh, we're doing that and in my other uh, research. Uh, this is just a general, I think, umbrella under which most of Dr. Shedd's uh, uh, work uh, comes. So thanks a lot to a number of people and thank you.